Thank you for joining us today for another presentation of Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. Welcome to Let the Bible Speak. Most places you go, there will be an 800-pound gorilla in the room. Almost everyone pretends this beast does not exist. If you don't mention this word in polite company, it's socially unacceptable. Although this beast exudes a foul odor, people have been surrounded by it for so long that they no longer smell it. Adam and Eve should have smelled that malodor when staring at the forbidden fruit, but they gobbled it down instead. We're talking about S-I-N, sin. And God says it stinks. What do you say? Can you smell that smell? It's rank, putrid, and rancid. Did you know Jesus died in part to activate, metaphorically speaking, our sense of smell? To recognize the stench of sin, especially when it invades our own lives? When we think of Jesus, we often focus on the blessings of grace, love, and forgiveness. And well, we should. These are the heart and soul of the gospel. Pulpits across the country are centered on these benefits today. May we never overlook them. Of course, when we maintain the Lord's Supper as an important element of our weekly worship service, it's difficult to lose sight of grace as we focus on Jesus' sacrifice and all that surrounds it. But keep in mind, taking in the greatness of God's grace and recognizing the abundance of His love and forgiveness is inextricably linked to our awareness of the extreme evil of sin and its consequences. Whenever we soften sin, we diminish God's grace. When we dismiss the idea of sin from our minds, we destroy the foundation of the gospel. Not only does the world reject the scriptures that call out specific sins, but the world insists that what God calls sin, the Christian must approve of and even celebrate as something beautiful, wholesome, and beneficial. And unfortunately, sometimes preachers do this. This morning, we heighten our awareness of the great evil conquered at the cross and revisit how that great sacrifice was intended to change our lives. But first, we have a song. The Bible addresses our sin in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, 
make those who approach perfect. But then, would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. God wanted to snuff out the stagnant smell of sin that dominated man's existence. Animal sacrifices only removed the odor temporarily. This didn't satisfy God. And since the stench of sin is barred from heaven, the blood of bulls and goats failed to give God's people the complete cleansing they so desperately needed. Animal blood did not provide the odor eater the Jews and now those of us who would be Christians sought. No one that ever lived was as sensitive to the stench of sin as was Jesus. He smelled it everywhere, often, no doubt. He was almost overcome by it when it surrounded him in such a concentrated form. Even the Pharisees who prided themselves in their moral superiority, they reeked of sin. You see, Jesus came to teach us about sin before he could tell us about salvation. It's hard to fathom how repulsed Jesus must have been on the cross. He bore your sins. He bore my sins. He bore the sins of the whole world, prospectively. Understand, on the other hand, S-I-N. Well, that's how Satan spells fun. S-I-N is how Satan spells victory. No, Satan cannot win the war. That's clear. But he can win battles. And obviously that's good enough for him. Time we get cynical about sin. Sin is real. And it's not our friend. It's not neutral. Sin slam the precious Lamb of God, to the cross. The Bible acknowledges the pleasure in sin, but emphasizes that sin, the pleasure of sin, is short-lived. Sin rejects restrictions for our ultimate good, and as a result, sin makes man literally sick. Sin by any other name is still sin, and it's killing us physically. More importantly, Sin separates us from God spiritually. Sin hinders our prayers. It breaks down our bodies. It weakens our marriages, cripples congregations, and hampers our happiness. Understand, if Satan had his way, he would remove the word sin from the English language. If Satan had his druthers, we'd either not smell what the scriptures call sin at all, or he would have us always savor sin, especially our own sin, as a pleasing aroma. He's fairly well succeeded in this objective as far as the world is concerned and not so far behind in Christendom, so-called. Not only can the worldly man no longer smell sin for the disgusting odor it gives off to God, but the people of God often seem not to be able to differentiate sin from any other smell. Sin just doesn't stand out like it used to. The word sin itself has largely vanished from our vocabularies unless we're in the house of God or reading the scriptures. Don't you know this gratifies the devil? Let's remember Satan is a predator and man is his prey. The apostle wrote in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walks about seeking whom he may devour. The weapons of His warfare are temptation and sin. And so if we can't smell the bait when he lays the trap, we're sitting ducks. Meanwhile, if God has his way, we will have our sense of smell exercised to discern both good and evil. If God has his way, we will recognize sin, especially our own sin, for what it is, and become increasingly repulsed by it. If God has his way, we will grow to hate every sin we commit, 
as much as we hate some of the sins others commit. As Paul put it in Romans 12, verse 9, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. When one who is not a child of God gets to this point, he will immediately desire to be born of water and of the Spirit. He'll want to get the stink off. When we as children of God smell that smell for what it is, we'll rush to cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh by repenting of our sin, confessing our sin, and praying to God to forgive us for our sin. Acts 8, verse 22 through 24, 1 John 1, verse 9. Again, that's something that only Christians can do. British statesman Edmund Burke is credited with a number of notable quotations. Among them, no passion so effectually robs the mind of all its powers of acting and reasoning as fear. Another, nothing is so fatal to religion as indifference. Burke also said, people never give up their liberties but under some delusion. My favorite Burke quote is, all that is needed for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Burke wrote after an election in 1771, our judgments stink in the nostrils of the people, indicating how morally reprehensible the government had become to the senses of the governed. How appropriate in our day and time. One of the oldest books in my library is titled Lancelot Andrews and His Private Devotions. Lancelot Andrews, Bishop of Winchester, was a notable scholar and preacher who, upon the passing of Queen Elizabeth I of England, spoke at the coronation ceremony of King James I in 1603 AD. Andrews was the royal chaplain to Queen Elizabeth I, King James I, and King Charles I. Andrews knew 15 modern languages and six ancient languages. No wonder he was the first scholar chosen for the great task of translating God's Word into the majestic King James Version that has blessed English-speaking people for over 400 years. The book, Lancelot Andrews and His Private Devotions, is an English translation of the prayers that he prayed in Greek and Latin. In one of his sermons on prayer, preached in 1611, Andrews said, Even so, the wicked imaginations and unchaste thoughts of our hearts which yield a stinking smell in the nostrils of God, are sweetened by no other means than by prayer. This great Bible scholar associated impure thoughts with a horrible odor that would ascend before the throne of a holy God. In Scripture, the idea of behavior putting out a foul odor is found in 2 Samuel 10, verse 6. The children of Ammon saw that they stank before David. Later, the New Living Translation puts the rebellion and disobedience of God's people in perspective when it renders Isaiah 65, verse 5, These people are a stench in my nostrils, an acrid smell that never goes away. The Holy Spirit suggests the same idea in 2 Peter 2, verse 20 through 22 by likening the Christian who goes back to sin as a dog that returns to his own vomit and to a sow having washed, to her wallowing in the mire. This is how sin smells to God. This is how God views my sin, your sin, any sin. Surely we don't want God to make these kind of associations with our lives. As a matter of fact, a number of New Testament scriptures use another olfactory metaphor to show how pleasing our lives can be to God. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 2, beginning with verse 14. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. We are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death and the other the aroma of life leading to life. He uses similar words in Ephesians 5 to describe how Christians dominated by lives of love give off a refreshing bouquet as the scent of their actions drift before his throne. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us 
and given himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. In Philippians 4, verse 18, Paul tells the Christians at Philippi that their generous financial support of his efforts to preach the gospel is presented to God as a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And of course, the most familiar positive scriptural citation associating the sense of smell with prayer is found in Revelation 8, verse 4. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. Dozens of times in the first five books of the Bible, God speaks of the different sacrifices and burnt offerings as coming before him as a sweet-smelling aroma. Then, the last time this phrase is used in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 20, verse 41, it describes the collective fragrance given off by the people of God. What a beautiful idea. I will accept you as a sweet aroma when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you have been scattered. and I will be hallowed in you before the Gentiles. The idea of a pleasant aroma is contrasted in the Old Testament with the especially abhorrent odor given off by certain sins. Some of the sins condemned in the Old Testament are so reprehensible to God that they are tagged by at least three different Hebrew words that are translated abomination. One Hebrew word, bash, means to have a bad smell, to stink, to smell bad. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says another word, pigul, translated abomination, refers to sacrificial flesh that has become stale, putrid, tainted. Leviticus 7, 18, Ezekiel 4, 14. Driver maintains that it occurs only as a technical term for such sacrificial flesh as has not been eaten within the prescribed time. And accordingly, he would everywhere render it specifically refuse meat. This would have little difference from the stench of rotting roadkill. You see, an abomination is the height of nastiness in God's nostrils. Now, I know nasty. So do you. Ever been to a congregation where a diaper was disposed of in the church bathroom on a Sunday in August? Air conditioner was not on. What happens when you walk in the door on Wednesday? The odor will nearly knock you down. I remember one sister was so overwhelmed by an odor that she cried out, we're going to have to cancel services. 50 miles from home, I hit a skunk. I forgot all about it a moment or two later until I stepped out of my vehicle. During an ice storm several years ago, our electricity was out for eight days. We blocked off our living room and one bathroom from the rest of the house and relied on our fireplace and blankets to keep warm. Now, my wife Louise is a great cook with the stove, the oven, the crock pot, even the microwave. But she's just not as experienced with cooking in a fireplace. We didn't have the right equipment either. With my worthless assistance, we put hot dogs in a roasting pan and tried to cook them in the fireplace. Unfortunately, after a few moments, the roasting pan was on fire. You can imagine the hooting and hollering with a couple of teenagers. By the time we got the pan out of the fireplace, the room was filled with the rancid odor of burnt hot dogs. Ugh. And no place to go. I played football in school. Football is a great sport, but a locker room crammed full of sweat encrusted pads, pants, shoes, and socks for 50 young men? That's repulsive. I like onion and garlic. I'd rather you leave them alone. We're making light of offensive odors, but listen, when these abhorrent odors hit our noses, we want out. We run the other way. They disgust us. They repel us. Please understand this morning, that's how God reacts to our sin, and that's how God wants us to react to sin, especially our own sin. When we see our sins as they truly are, we should be anxious to eliminate them. Let's remember where sin comes from. Sin is the creation of Satan. 
God made man upright and placed him in the pristine environment of the Garden of Eden. Satan enticed Adam and Eve to sin. Would you buy a painting or a piece of pottery made by Charles Manson or some violent terrorist and place it in your home? Of course not. Well, neither should we take any sin, the creation of Satan, and hang it in our hearts or harbor it in our lives. Not including its synonyms, the word sin is found over 400 times in the Bible, while the more intense word abomination is found only about 70 times. Ponder carefully some of the sins that come before God as those that give off what he considers these most offensive odors. Proverbs 6, verse 16. These six things the Lord hates, yes, seven, are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. Proverbs 15, verse 8, the sacrifice or worship of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loves him who follows righteousness. Consider Proverbs 17, verse 15. He that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 28, verse 9. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. We don't usually think of a prayer being an abomination, but that's what he says. If we're not living for God, if we're not listening to God, God doesn't want to hear our prayer. It's an abomination to him. Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. Never has this scripture been more relevant in my lifetime than today. This abomination is striking because it shows God doesn't view cross-dressing as some harmless peculiarity of disturbed individuals. A man dressing like a woman and a woman dressing like a man is an abomination before God. This comes from the word abomination that means disgusting or detestable. This idea is supported in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 2 through 16, and in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, where we find the effeminate will not inherit the kingdom of God. God wants men to be men and women to be women. Leviticus 20, verse 13. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. One question we have to ask ourselves as we make this study applicable is... If something is an abomination in the Old Testament, if it disgusts God, if it gives off a foul odor from God's perspective in the Old Testament, will it give off a pleasing aroma in the New? We find in Revelation 21, verse 27, the following morning, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. They which are written, in the Lamb's Book of Life. The word abomination is used much more sparingly in the New Testament, only six times, in fact. These instances teach some very significant lessons. Perhaps the most striking is Jesus' use in Luke 16, verse 15. Hear this. You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Friends, Just because someone or something is highly valued and respected among men does not mean that it should be so among the people of God. Just because a behavior is sanctioned by the United States Supreme Court does not mean it's sanctioned by the great heavenly tribunal. There's good news behind this message. The best news of all, in fact. That is, the stench of sin can be covered with the fresh fragrance of forgiveness. Contact us to receive the cleansing Saul of Tarsus received 
in response to hearing the gospel in Acts 22:16. Stay with us for final words after our song. There's a happy land of promise over in the great beyond. Let the Bible Speak. If you'd like help in obeying the gospel, please contact us. Call, text, or email us for a copy of 1324, The Stench of Sin. You may also request, at no cost, the Truth Frees Bible Study course. Visit LetTheBibleSpeak.com to watch videos, hear audio, and read transcripts of the program at your convenience. On behalf of the congregations listed shortly, we echo the sentiment of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye and may God bless you. We hope you've been challenged and encouraged by Bible teaching. We strive to speak the truth in love and aspire to help you make heaven your home. I have dear friends among congregations in your area committed to worshiping in spirit and in truth, John 4 verse 24. Know that when you visit, you will not be singled out or embarrassed, but will receive a warm welcome from caring Christians. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. We hope by God's providence to be an avenue through which you more fully live out the will of God. My dear friends near you are knowledgeable and approachable Bible teachers. They would gladly meet with you to discuss the scriptures with an open Bible. Life is short, so short. James 4.14 says, Our life is like a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. We hope you see the urgency in doing all you can as soon as you can to make sure your life is right with God. Get the Let the Bible Speak app and visit letthebiblespeak.com for a wealth of biblical teaching. Call, text, or email, and we'll personally return each message you send to us.